you guys all for coming out. It's uh, and we're going to get things started. Of course, as Rachel mentioned, we are recording. Um, and today we're going to go over a, a couple of things regarding the Sentinel Apiary program. Um, first, we have uh, Rachel Kuypers here, who's our Sentinel Apiary program coordinator. Uh, we also have on uh, from the team Natalie Steinhauer, who is our scientific uh, coordinator. So she she uh, crunches all the data and, and of course helps to set up all these uh, different types of research projects that we do. So um, also we have Matt Huffinger, who is uh, one of our tech transfer team members out in California. And we also have Michaela Wilson, who's our IT gal out of Tennessee. Um, I'm, I kind of run a bit of support and, and do other things. My name is Eric Malcolm. And, uh, and we also actually have Annette Meredith on uh, and as a observer. Uh, she's our executive director. So thank you all for coming and we're looking forward to, uh, to sharing what we found this year. And also, just uh, just uh, as we go through the presentations and uh, and the the evening, you're welcome to ask questions in the chat box down below. Um, we'll do our best to answer them. And uh, if they're pertaining to the person's presentation, of course, we'll save them till the end of the presentation. And at the end of um, at end of Rachel's introduction of what Sentinel is to explain a little bit more about the program. Um, and then after Natalie Steinhauer's presentation on some of the findings, we'll actually have kind of a little bit more of an open forum for Q&A. So a couple of us will be act as a panel to, to help answer your questions uh, either the best we can or, or what we've observed. <laughs> so, so thanks so much. Uh, Eric, would you mind watching the waiting room too? Yeah, of course. Go Thank on. you very much. All right, let me just share my screen. Okay, does everyone see the right, the, the right screen, the full PowerPoint? Looking good. Oh, actually, we, we see the, uh, the entire screen, the presenter screen. Okay. So you gotta share your extended screen. Ah, here we go. There you go. Better? Well, that looks good. Awesome, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. As Eric mentioned, I'm the, um, the um, Sentinel Apiary Program Coordinator. Uh, my name is Rachel. And so a lot, and we're very excited to have you here today. Um, we appreciate you uh, spending your time to join us here. Um, so this is the recap for the 2021 season. Um, since a lot of uh, attendees here are not yet participants of the program, I'm just gonna do a quick overview. Um, so what is Sentinel? Um, so Sentinel is a citizen science program that empowers beekeepers across the country to monitor their colonies regularly throughout the beekeeping season. So our long-term goal is to act as a, well, and our short-term goal too, uh, is to act as an early warning system. So uh, if you look at this, phenomenal um, um, illustration uh, that Eric put together with the varroa mites on the uh, intruder. Uh, you can think of this as, uh, you know, the medieval sentries standing guard uh, that were there to alert for intruders. So that's kind of our goal. Um, and it's, it also acts as a teaching tool. So some clubs use the program to um, do, to teach inspections to participants um, so that they can get in colonies themselves and learn how to properly inspect the colonies and sample them. Um, some of our participants uh, run uh, small experiments in their yards uh, using our, our data that we send back. Um, and some beekeepers use it to either hold themselves accountable and continue to go into their colonies regularly or to improve uh, specific inspection skills. Um, so it has a lot of um, different meanings depending on who is using the program. Um, so as I mentioned, it's where our long-term goal is to be a early warning system across the country. Um, so this is the front of the um, Sentinel webpage, and this is our live map. So this is the 2021 um, average varroa loads. So you can see that we're missing a lot of regions. Um, so as we progress through the years, we just started in 2014. So as we progress through the years, 
uh, we'll be able to uh, fill in those gaps and have more representation across the country. Um, so uh, logistically, how does it work? Um, so depending on your apiary size, particip participants can choose either a four, eight, or 12 colony kit. Um, and our, our prices are on our website. Um, if you want to learn more. Um, and then each month they inspect and sample those same four, eight, or 12 colonies. Uh, they send in those samples and the inspection notes, management records uh, to the University of Maryland Diagnostic Lab. And, um, and then we analyze those for Varroa and Nosema and we send back a report with the lab results and all the notes that they sent in. Um, so this is some of our, our most valuable data here at BIP because it combines the um, well, it combines the health context with the actual results. So it's um, longitudinal data. So it's the same colonies each month for six months from May through October. Um, and it has all of the, the context. So the management data and all of that. Uh, so our goal is to also eventually learn to uh, better control uh, various diseases in, in honeybees. Um, and you know, this is the kind of thing that that BIP, we couldn't do it on our uh, we couldn't do it on our own at this scale. Uh, so that's why our citizen scientists are so valuable to our program. Um, and so, because of the way that the data is is collected with all of this context around it, both the beekeeper and the researchers that are using the data are able to have that context, such as like. Um, you can think of it as like a, like a primary care physician. So you go to the same doctor for years, they have all of your health records and they're able to better understand your health. Uh, so some of the things that people have said that they use the program for, uh, I said a teaching tool, um, it, it reinforces the need to continuously monitor, um, not only just in general, but also before and after treatments because you never know what's gonna happen. Um, it, it holds people accountable. Um, it also has, uh, it also serves as a community and it helps reduce barriers to colony inspections and monitoring. Uh, we have a lot of educational resources to help with that. Um, and we also archive about 10% of our samples every year. So what that does is it kind of, it's like a time capsule. So if, you know, years down the road, we find out about some new disease or some, some new mite or pest or whatever, we can go back into those samples and get an idea of whether they were present, um, you know, back in 2012 or, but not 2012, but, you know, a couple of years ago or whatever. Um, so what does a year of Sentinel look like? Uh, so for the lab, uh, we start the year out with kit building. Um, this looks like it's uh, in somebody's kitchen because it is, uh, as the past couple of years have been kind of back and forth between work from home and, and working in the lab. Um, and so you can see the different things that you'll get in a kit. You get sample bottles filled with a saltwater solution. Um, these are some of the inspection guides. I don't know if you all can see my mouse, but, um, or my pointer, but uh, we have resources, hive tags, um, the, all the things that you'll need. In May through October, uh, the, for the participants, uh, you sample your colonies, you take your notes, and then you mail them in. We process them for Varroa and Nosema, and then we send back a report with all of your data on it. And then the end of the year, we put together this end of year report that you're about to learn more about, um, and recruitment for the next year begins. So to begin the recap of 2021, um, this past year, uh, we introduced a lot of new things to the program. Uh, we introduced an app that allows beekeepers to directly upload their, their uh, inspection notes and management data to our database um, instead of just writing it all on a sheet and mailing in the sheet. Uh, we introduced a dashboard that allows beekeepers to directly download their results from our database. And we also introduced a uh, 12 colony kit. So previously it was just four or eight colonies, now it's 12. Um, and we also had uh, monthly webinars. Um, and so the, some of our participants were able to get together and chat about beekeeping and um, you know, what, what was happening that, that month and how their bees were looking. 
Um, so now we are going to move into the data discussion. Um, so this is a picture from last year. Um, it shows the, the title is for what's about to come, but um, you can see here that our Sentinel participants um, on average have lower rates of, or lower varroa loads than the national average. Um, and yeah, so I will stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Natalie. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for the preview, uh, the first preview of the 2021 uh, results for the Sentinel program. So uh, our lab sure was really busy this year. We actually uh, increased the number of participants compared to previously and number of total samples that were processed at the lab. Uh, in 2021, we actually had 92 participants, but some of them uh, provided data for more than one location. So we actually had 128 APRES uh, that were represented in a program. And here are some, um, most of the, the GPS uh, information. We did have a couple of, of participants that didn't provide the GPS, but for, for most of them, you can see the distribution um, of our participants on, on this map. So, um, all throughout the, the season from April to November, um, we recorded, uh, they recorded um, uh, information about 531 colonies and all throughout the year that represented over 2,400 records. Um, so as you can see from our map, um, uh, this year we didn't have any participants from the West and North Central, but other than that, we were present in all of the uh, eight out of the nine uh, climatic region of the United States, as well as non-continental USA, which was um, pretty exciting to, to receive some samples from them as well. Um, so as you can see in uh, 2020, 20, sorry, in 2021, we actually um, were mostly busy between May and October. Most of our samples uh, received during that time. But of course, some people uh, like to sample early. So we had some participants sending as soon as as early as April and some as late as November. Uh, in, on average, participants sent uh, 4.7 of their kits back um, uh, uh, for analysis out of the six months of the program. So we did have uh, participants that did not uh, completely fully uh, use the program as, as much as they could have. So I'm going to start by showing some results for Varroa. So of course, we all know here uh, 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 what Varroa, that Varroa is this uh, uh, ectoparasite that is uh, attacking honeybees. And um, in addition to directly have an impact on the bees uh, by, by feeding on their tissue, they are also transmitting viruses. So it's really a pest that we're trying to, uh, to keep under control. Uh, Varroa was originated from uh, Asia. It arrived in, the, in, in, in North America uh, in the early um, 1980s in, in America, in the US, um, so in 1987. And since then, we really have been um, working really hard to, to keep that pest under, under red. So we do know a lot about the biology of Varroa, and so I, rec I cannot recommend enough the, the, the tools for Varroa management from the Honeybee Coalition, where you can actually see some uh, very good illustration of this cycle that we know Varroa go through on a year-to-year -year basis. So we do know that uh, the, the, the number of Varroa in the colony actually uh, grows throughout the season, peaks in the fall, and then um, is reduced again when the, when the colony goes dormant for the winter and um, uh, the, the capped group population is reduced. Um, and so um, based on that is actually, uh, you can see from the, the Bee Health Coalitions, the actual um, uh, thresholds of action that they recommend based on all of those different phases that the colony goes through during the year. So, um, as I said, we, we know a lot about this cycle. Um, uh, and part of the reason is thanks to this uh, survey that the University of Maryland 
um, uh, is associated with, which is the National Honeybee Disease Survey. And I'm mentioning this because a lot of times in your reports, as well as in this final report and in this fig those figures that I'm going to show in a minute, we use this uh, survey as kind of our external comparison or baseline to compare what all respondents um, um, uh, see and observe in their colony and compare it to this national baseline. So whenever you see national um, uh, results uh, in my figures or in your reports, we are referring to the National Honeybee Disease Survey. For more information about that survey, I recommend you to go to those two links, uh, the US Honeybee Health Survey information for all of the information on the survey directly. But you can also go on our website on the Bee Informed Partnership because uh, we are actually very lucky to work very closely with them and uh, hosting a lot of their data. And so you can actually uh, see their, their state reports uh, on our website as well. All right, so what were Varroa looking like in 2021? I'm gonna stop keeping the suspense up. Um, so here is um, on, on blue, you can see that national level baseline that I was referring to. And on, in orange is um, the levels of our participants in 2021. So this represents the average, um, um, the average load of Varroa infestation in uh, Varroa per 100 bees. And you can see here, I'm gonna see if I can put the laser pointer so that I can show you on my screen. So this dotted line here represents three mites per 100 B. So as we were saying a couple of, uh, of minutes ago, that the action threshold actually varies according to the time of the year. But as a, as a simplification, we put this at three mites per 100 bees because that's the action threshold for the fall. And uh, unfortunately, as you can see, the average uh, uh, typically always goes over that threshold in the fall. But this is really much this, this curve that we are expecting that varroa loads uh, uh, infestation really peaks into the fall. And that's true. Um, as well for you know, all participants that it is for the national level. Now you can see that um, all participants, the Sentinel par uh, participants did better than the national level. Uh, and this is actually something that we have seen um, over the years. So this is again, the same graph, the average represented on this axis and per, per month. And here I'm showing you um, not only this last year, but a couple of years ago as well. So just so that you can get a sense for, for this trend that is repeating year after year. And there, you know, there were some years where you know, we are on par or a little higher, but most of the time, Sentinel participants are, are a little, doing a little bit better than the national average in terms of, of Varroa loads. So the next graph that I'm figuring, that I'm gonna show you, um, I'm taking a, a second because it, it, is, it looks really impressive, but it's not. Um, this is the same data again, but this time I'm showing you the distribution of the data. So instead of just showing you the average with a confidence interval, here those, those bar graph represents actually the, the full distribution of the data. So this is actually a little bit better to see the, the range of the data because you know every time you show an average, uh, average always hides a lot of the variation of the data. So here you can see how you know, the, the best of the best, the minimum that you saw were all the way to zero. And then some very unlucky beekeepers were all the way to 20, 30 or more uh, percent infestation. So you can see that the range is, is, is really wide. Um, and this, this middle bar in the middle of each of those, those boxes, the middle one represents the median. So the median, you can, you, you can interpret that as 50% of the data points are above and 50% are below. So it really represents the central tendency um, uh, for that specific month. And so you can see here, I'm comparing the distribution of that data for the, the national in blue and then the Sentinel participant in orange year after year. And, and this um, uh, estimate here on the, dot, the dotted line is actually a, a moving average. So it shows you the tendency of the data. And so you can see again, this is another representation that on average, Sentinel participants are lower than, um, than the, the national averages. Uh, and this is true for most of the years. And of course, we're still waiting on the 2021 for the national level because they're always one year delayed. Um, so we will, we will see that next year. But again, we're pretty much expecting that the national average is probably falling a little higher uh, than the Sentinel participant in 2021. Okay, so as we were talking about, there is a lot of variation of the data. You know, the average is one thing, but then you can see that some of those, you know, parts, some of those colonies were very, really highly infested. So this, in this next figure, we kind of like split 
um, the samples according to how they fall according to that the threshold of three mites per hundred bees. So let me uh, explain to you how this graph works. So you you have uh, one bar per month, and I'm showing for you the previous year of the of the Sentinel um, first, and then we'll go to 2021. And so this actually represents the all of the samples that we received that month. So 100% of the sample received in March, and you can see that uh, this represents the fraction that were uh, negative, meaning that we did not had any mite detected in the sample. So that doesn't mean that the colony was fully varroa free, it just means that that was below the level of detection. Um, and then in orange is representing those so samples that were positive, we did find mites in them, but they were below that action threshold of 3%. So they were, you know, they were mite presence, but maybe uh, not at a concerning level yet, uh, depending on, on the season. And then above uh, three mite per, uh, three percent infestation is what we consider, um, you know, a colony that is um, um, uh, a problematically high number of varroa. Um, and again, this is a simplification, as we say, the, the threshold itself might vary between region and 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 months. But this just show you, like how you can see here that month after month, that the fraction of the sample that are uh, uh, concerning is increasing from months to months. Um, and so, so this is a, the, the general trend that we see um, uh, every year in the survey. And you can see how we are seeing the same trend again in 2021, where the, the percentage of positive samples increase uh, months and months after months, and the, the percentage of, of samples over threshold increase as well. So overall, in 2021, we detected Varroa in over 60% of the samples. And um, uh, for those positive samples, you know, the fraction of those that reach the 3% infestation mites, as I said, it's also increased months to months. And by October, by this last month, uh, we actually had, you know, if you put red and orange together, we had 82% of the samples that were found with mites. And, and actually, you can see here, this level is actually 50% of, of the colonies, 50% of the samples received in October uh, we're actually above the action threshold level. All right. So over the years, we actually have received uh, results from, from us from throughout the country. And, and so when we have enough data, what, what we like to do is actually show those trends by region, um, climatic region groupings, because, you know, the, the, um, the, the growth curve of varroa or other, uh, you know, for nozima or for uh, frames of bees really depends on the region. And so um, this year we actually were able to, to do this tally for three regions in particular, the east, north, central, northeast, and the southeast, in which we had enough participants every month and enough samples every month to be able to do that tally uh, representatively. And so you can see here how um, you know, the, the, in gray, you have the, the previous years, and in orange, you have the 2021. I'm sorry, my legend got cut out here. Um, so yeah, gray is previous year of the survey, and orange is the 2021 Sentinel participants. Um, um, and then you can see how um, the, you know, we, in both, in all of those three regions, we do see that um, uh, the, the, this curve of, of, of Varroa, uh, but it's more intense in, the, in East North, Central and Northeast that it is in the Southeast, for example. So this already tells us a little more, um, you know, not comparing to the national baseline, but comparing to uh, what is regionally relevant for you. Moving on from Varroa to Nozima. So we, um, um, again, I'm gonna show you some, some, some general uh, results that we received this year for, for Nozima. We had over 2,200 uh, samples that were um, sent to the University of Maryland to be analyzed for Nozima. And again, here I'm showing you in blue the national numbers that come from the National Honeybee Disease Survey from APHIS, and then in orange is the Sentinel participants from this year. And so um, one thing that is um, that you can see here is that uh, at early in the year, in the spring, uh, our participant had higher level of nosemal that, that is expected at the national, under the national, national level. <clears throat> and just for uh, information, the, the level that we put here at 1 million spore per bee is what is typically usually considered as an, as an action threshold, as a, as a threshold of, of caution. 
uh, though there is, you know, um, not a lot of, of um, uh, actual um, proof that this is actually linked with, with, with bad colony outcomes. It is it's just something that is usually referred to uh, in the literature as, an, as a potential level for, for concern. So yeah, we, we actually had a higher level of nozema at the earlier in the, in the year. And then again, this, um, this drop in nozema uh, for the rest of the season is something that you actually have seen year after year, um, <clears throat> sorry, in our program. So showing you this, um, uh, this trend in multiple years of the survey, you can see in this graph, the same data showing you the national level in blue, and then different levels of gray is the different years of the Sentinel going back a, a couple of years. And you can see that on, it is actually pretty usual for, for Sentinel participants to have higher loads than the national average. But then again, those typically drop pretty fast. And in a month or two, uh, those levels be become on their own uh, below, um, below concerns, uh, levels of concerns. <clears throat> the next figure is the same as I showed you for Varroa, where you can see the distribution of the data rather than the just uh, single average. And so this is just an, another view of the same data, just to you know, try to approach the data from another perspective, but to get the, the same information where you can see that um, <clears throat> uh, for the different, you know, for last four years of, this, of, the, of the program, um, we, Sentinel participants tend to have higher levels early in the year, and then those, those fall uh, and become very comparable to the national levels. Um, for the rest of the of the season, and so you can see this 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 classical trend uh, in like this classical drop of of nozema, where whenever we see nozema early in the year, it typically drop on its own um, after a few weeks. <clears throat> in terms of the proportion of samples that were uh, found negative, positive, and positive above the one million spore per B threshold. And you can see the same trend where um, in April is when we actually, April, May is when we have the highest infection loads and then the, um, most of the samples become, become negative as the, as the season go. So in, um, in 2021 for the Sentinel participant, we had detected nozema in about 54% of the Sentinel samples. So a little more than half were found with nozema in 2021. Um, and so this, this percentage continuous EMA was uh, highest in May and then, and then uh, dropped for the rest of the season, which as we said, is a trend that we see uh, year after year. Sorry, this is another figure where uh, we can see the, um, the splits of this trend according to the region. And I thought that this was particularly interesting because you can see how, um, from the Sentinel participant, we really see that the high nozema in the earlier in the season is really more of a problem in the East North Central than any other region um, uh, in the US. So this seems to be a, a regional trend as uh, the, um, at this early peak of nozema, uh, as we can see from the Sentinel participants. <clears throat> All right, moving on from Avaro and Nozima, one of the things that um, our, our beekeepers are uh, taking notes um, and recording their, their inspection notes um, through our application, uh, one thing that they document is the colony strengths. And so thanks to that, we actually now have a couple of years of very good documentation of the average <clears throat> strengths of a colony uh, from our participants. And so you can see here, the 2021 result in, in, in orange compared to previous year of the survey of the Sentinel program. Um, and so you can see how, um, you know, for, for most of the months in April, we do not have a lot of, of replication, but from May to October, November, we do have um, a pretty good estimation of that, um, you know, colonies on average uh, vary between 12 to 16 frame of bees and then, you know, peak in, in July and then, uh, start to, to decline again in August. <clears throat> this is just to show you that um, it is, you know, it seems to be very consistent from year to year. There are some slight, slight variations, some years, you know, where the, the growth peaks earlier um, and, or in some years where it peaks a little later. Um, but overall, you can see this, this, this beautiful curve 
um, every year pretty consistently. This is another view of the data where you can see the distribution. As we said, average always hides the, the variation where you can see that though on average you are above, like as was, I was main, mentioning between 12 and, and 16 frames, you do have a lot of variation from colony to colony. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, um, and so, but still, you know, the max, the, 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 the most of the data, uh, which is represented by this, this square box, uh, still, um, you can see that, that this variation goes from, you know, 10 to 20 colonies at the peak in, in July, most of the 15 to 20 colonies most of the year. Uh, sorry, 15 to, to 20 frames of bees at the peak of the season. <clears throat> One thing that uh, we, we were very happy uh, to propose this year was um, through the app, um, our participants were able to record the management actions that they performed uh, during the year. And so as they were documenting, um, uh, as they were taking samples months after months, one of the things that they could do was actually re record whenever they perform a certain action. And so over the year, we actually had 138 entries uh, from participants that use our application to document um, uh, some management. They were, those uh, 138 entries were actually uh, entered by 31 beekeeper out of the 96 that participated in our program. So one in three beekeepers actually used uh, our, uh, um, our tool to enter their management and they reported on 34 different locations. So here you can see um, the, 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 the different um, management practices that those, those beekeepers re reported for all of those different locations according to, to the month. Uh, so you can see how um, beekeepers change equipment more, more often in May and June than any other months. Um, the feeding was more intense in May. Um, well, you know, you might wonder if uh, the, the, maybe we had the loss of, um, of um, participants and they didn't record the <clears throat> feeding for the winter. And then um, we also had uh, when beekeepers harvested honey, requeened colonies and treated uh, their colonies. <coughs> Sorry. So over this uh, year, we actually had 52 entries um, of beekeeper documenting a treatment. And those were recorded by 17 beekeepers in 20 locations. And so what we are hoping, um, so 20 locations is, is, um, is a great start. And what we're hoping is that this pushes uh, participant next year to continue documenting and providing us this information um, to be able to then try to dig a little deeper into um, treatment effectiveness and, and see the results um, uh, in terms of loads that we can, we can see from month to month in operation. Um, so yeah, sorry, I wanted to show this first. So this is the type of, of figures that we're hoping to be able to do more in the future where you can see, uh, for example, I, I picked uh, two of those 20 location, uh, just well, not randomly, but to, to express the point where you can see here very different conditions where a, a beekeeper on the left that used a, a treatment um, um, uh, and apparently, you know, maybe they got reinfested after treatment, but they didn't seem to have uh, the, the desired effect. And then these other uh, beekeepers that actually um, ha seem to have a pretty effective uh, treatment application. So those type of, of um, you know, differentiating treatments according to, to their efficacy on, or the resulted um, uh, after treatment is something we wanna do more of um, as we collect more information about, about your management. And finally, I wanted to finish by uh, what were the products most reported by beekeepers that use the, the, the the Sentinel program to record uh, action events this year. Uh, the, <clears throat> on, out of the 52 entries, as I said, 17 beekeeper out of 20 location, the most used product was formic acid that was used in 15 location by 12 beekeepers. And you can see that um, uh, formic acid here in those like rust color uh, was used you know, in all of the months from May to September, uh, though mostly was used, you know, in July and September. And then uh, the second most, um, most used product was oxalic acid that was used by eight beekeepers in nine location. Um, and so that is here in, in dark red that was actually mostly used 
early on in the year in May. And so with that, um, uh, that was the end of the, the sneak peek on the reports. We are hoping to be able to send you the, the PDF of the report uh, for all our Sentinel participants uh, before the end of the week. And we will also post it online when ready. Awesome, thank you so much, Natalie. Yeah, thank you, Natalie, that was great. See if I can figure out how to share my screen again. Now, Rachel, before we go on to the the next thing, do we want to take the questions for Natalie? Because we had a couple couple of uh, good questions coming in there. Yes, um, that is a great idea. Do you all see the full PowerPoint? Mm -mm. No, that's it. I see, I see wonderful people. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, the only other thing that I had um, on my slides was this link that I want to share with everyone. Uh, Natalie, I saw that you shared the um, Honeybee Health Coalition. Uh, and I, we, Natalie and I did not talk about this, uh, but my next slide was a screenshot of their um, bro management decision tool because I just think it's so awesome. So if anybody's ever looking for help with, um, with you know, making decisions for treatments, um, that's a great res resource that I just linked. Um, and Rachel, um Someone asked if uh, if we could show the slide with the numbers of participants again. Okay, I will show that. Um, all right. And I'm I'm looking to the chat to see uh, questions that were addressed to me. If you want to, if you have them and you want to read them to me, Eric, that'd be great. Yes, definitely. So um, the first question came in from Carly Williams. Um, so Marilyn Beekeeper, uh, she she was asking about who generates the national data, and um, so we we there was that was addressed in the chat. And, you know, it's it, the AFIS National Honeybee Survey, and you know that's a conglomeration of uh, or the, the people collecting the samples are the Apiary Inspectors of America. We've got a couple of of uh, BIP tech transfer teams that yes, and you can you can find more about that survey uh, on those oh sorry those two links that I'm showing you in the screen yes. right now. So the question um, that she had after that was, are national survey levels more commercial? Um, so, or, or is it kind of an average? Like what's that is a great question. So it's actually not just commercial at all. There are uh, APR inspectors that actually are or, or partners that, that sample throughout this, the states. Um, we'll actually uh, select beekeepers, um, um, well, so they're supposed to select them uh, according to like quadrants of the state to represent more or less all of the area of the state, but they will also sample from commercial and small scale beekeepers. So they do tend to, 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 to sample from all types of operation. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, oh, actually someone, uh, Susan, I, I may have to I may have to ask you to clarify. That's a good question to ask right up front, depending on the the one you're talking about. Uh, you say uh, how are beekeepers recruited for the program? Um, so are you speaking about the Sentinel program? Perfect, thank you. Um, so that is actually it's a opt in. So people uh, you know can can join. Um, well, basically between typically we'll start uh, registration. I believe in like December, late December, January. And go through um, May, so that's that's coming. So sorry, I, I just jumped in on that one. Okay, so next question we've got um, Anya McQuirk asked: Are the okay? So this Natalie, this one's for you specifically. Are the tail distribution getting thicker? It looked like there are more outliers this year. The trails, I'm not sure. I guess this is the, the figure to show it. Um, I mean, so the the, the way that the outliers are, are mathematically um, 
I identified is um, uh, is when you when you actually see the the seventy five percent of the data is inside that box. So this is what we call the interquartile range from twenty five to seventy five percent of the data. This is like the the core of the distribution, right? Seventy five percent of the of most of the observation. Um, and so this dif this distance is what is measured, and all of those points are those that are twice more, you know. Um, twice away, at more than twice away from this maximum range here uh, than, than this distance in between. So that is just the definition of an outlier. It's twice the different the distance away from, um, from the 75% as, as this interquartile range. So uh, that doesn't mean that those outliers are removed from our observation. I do not delete data, even if there are outliers. So those are still going to be part of all the averages. And as you can see, that it really depends on on how compacted the distributions are, because if most of the points are below, then those points that are at this level are going to already be outliers, even if you see that the last years they were still part of the distribution. So it's really just a mathematical um, uh, concept uh, that is useful because sometimes if if a, if a point is like you know if I had a point at I don't know 125. You know, it would be so far off that I'm, I would be questioning, oh, but maybe that data was actually, you know, not real and it was an artifact or it was a miscalculation. So that's the, the advantage. I mean, that's the use of, 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 of looking at those distribution is to see if there are points that are really out of the norm uh, as uh, in a way that you wouldn't actually believe is true. But all of those are still uh, still in the, um, you know, not out of the, the realm of possibilities. We have seen colonies here uh, that are you know at those 30 to 50 percent infestation rates um so they're they're very high but they're they're not unbelievable uh, thank you so the the next question um next actually the, the next couple of questions kind of re revolve around nozema um so there was there was kind of a a cluster of questions that randy chimed in on as well um but with nozema um, so there's two people asking about it, so I'm trying to figure out how to put this together, but I'm just going to ask the first one. Why is Nozema higher earlier in the year rather than increasing proportionally with the mite load? Um, and the kind of the second part of, you know, the second person who asked a similar question um, for the Nozema slides was, uh, what does the ENC stand for? I see, I see. Okay, so the first question about uh, Nozema being the the peak of Nozema being early in the season and then declining uh, the, the rest of the season. So as I said, this is a trend that we, we see in Sentinel, but we actually see it as well at the national level. Um, um, so here, you know, is this actually something that we see as well um, for, from, 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 you know, this, this depend, independent survey as well. This is something that we've uh, known about Nozema for a long time. Uh, it is usually um, believed to be uh, a, a spring issue uh, that is associated with uh, maybe higher humidity in the colony um, or uh, um, um, it's it's a pro it's a problem that also sometimes people will say if you, if they have a good uh, pollen flow it will clear out on its own um, so um, yeah that's just it's not it's not associated um, with the with the brood the way that varroa is so varroa we know it peaks in the fall because it's just it's it's it's, it's um um, the varroa use the, 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 the capped brood to reproduce. And so as long as you have capped broods, their, their reproduction will accelerate. And so their numbers just grows and grows and grows throughout the season. And then it drops again when the capped brood uh, is reduced. And when you have a, a break in, 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 the, in, the, in the laying, in the queen laying. But uh, Nozima is a, is a very different, it's not associated with, with the brood in the same way. It's really just um, um, it's a fungal, um, it's a microsporidian, so it's mostly associated to fungal disease uh, that is mostly uh, linked with weak colonies in the spring. So it's usually before they start to build up, before they start bringing in uh, um, good pollen. And, and, and so that, that usually is when we believe that that's why we have most of the, the highest infection of Nozema in the spring. And, and I would like to, uh, to uh, you know, invite all the other panelists to help me answer those questions as well. So if you want to chime in, uh, please do. Matt. 
Yeah, so Kelly, Kelly Kalhanik's on the call. Thank you, Kelly. Hey, <laughs> that's awesome. And that, thank you for, thank you for addressing that. Yeah, uh, Hi, Kelly. Hey. <laughs> Hi, guys. Great job. Good to see you. <laughs> So, and to the, for the uh, Eric, we're losing you a little bit. It's great to see you, Kelly. University of Maryland is our Sentinel, um, kind of our, our data data research person there for a, a long time and helped to run that program with Dan Reynolds. So, you know, oh, it's nice to see you, Kelly. Um, okay, so let's see. We, we had um. Oh, okay, Gary I had the ES, sorry. I had ENC. The second question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so ENC stands for East North Central, and so that was just the name of one of the of the region. Uh, sorry. So ENC represents this region here in green. That was what it stands for. And, oh yeah. Thank you. In I'm assuming that's that's regarding the uh, the mite treatment. I'm sorry, Eric, we lost you. I couldn't I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, did I cut out? Yes, you did. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Gary Fish asked, "How do you tease out improper application or rates of application?" I'm, I'm assuming that's for mite treatment. Okay. Um, so in terms of the, the management action that were recorded, uh, as I said, this is the beginning of our uh, documenting, uh, you know, having beekeepers enter the management action directly using, using the app. So um, currently the, the way the app records information is uh, first you get, you know, you can enter by the whole apiary or by colonies, you can act, the, the type of action is the first question. And then when beekeepers select treat, then they have follow up question, which is the, the product. And then they can enter the dose, uh, the um, or, or or they can enter nodes. Um, so, so at this point, I've really just looked at um, the product use that they the product that they they named as, as their um, you know the type of, of treatment that they did. I didn't uh, look any more into the nodes of uh, the actual formulation. So I wouldn't be able to give you specifics on the methods and uh, dose of application. Okay, thank you. So Natalie, um, next question, which I think may kind of uh, fold into one that was also asked previously, but um, it has kind of some extended uh, you know, query after it. Uh, so why is there a spike in nosema in May? And since the trend is downward after that, is there any reason to treat anyway? Treatment for nosema isn't too simple. That is a great question. Uh, and this is actually something that we are, um, often wondering ourselves. So this is something that, uh, that is one of the reasons why we are documenting Nozima mostly in the spring, um, because um, as we said, it is a spring disease. It is often associated with those, those um, um, spring condition and, and small colonies. And so it, we do see that Nozima tends to clear on its own, whether or not um, you use a treatment for it. And this is something not that we've seen with Sentinel because we haven't, our, um, we actually haven't really um, uh, uh, used the Sentinel data to show that, but we have done uh, some uh, field studies uh, with, with beekeepers. And yeah, just skip. Matt, do you want to jump in, Helen, help me out a little bit? You're muted. Sorry, Natalie, I got caught uh, reading a, uh, a direct message. <laughs> Never mind. That's okay. <laughs> so, so yeah. So we we well, I agree with you that um, this is uh, this is a, this is we actually do not recommend people to to treat for for nozema. Uh, there is one product on the market which is Fumagillin B. Um, but um, one thing to know about nozema, if you if you were part of our uh, uh, actually I think we had a a webinar earlier in the year where we, we talked about Nozima specifically but there is two strains of Nozima Nozima apis and Nozima serenae Nozima apis was the one that was present in the United States uh, a long time ago and that is actually the one on which most of the the, the research had been done um, and and this was the one for which Fumagin B had been uh, developed and tested and found to be effic effic effective against against that strain. 
Uh, of, uh, however, since then, uh, we've actually known, again, thanks to the, the EFE survey, that Nozima apis has been mostly completely replaced by Nozima serenae, this new strain of Nozima. And there is competing evidence that tend to see that uh, uh, fumagilin B might not be as effective against, against Nozima uh, serenae, um, and that it might not be worse um, uh, um, to, 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 to treat as it doesn't like it doesn't seem like it's making a difference in the reduction of, of nosema spores in the spring. I can add a little bit to that, Natalie. Yeah. Uh, as far as nosema, we sample a lot of beekeepers in California and uh, commercial beekeepers. And two years ago, uh, we did something like 1,400 nosema samples. Uh, they were very concerned about their nosema levels. Uh, one year ago, we only took about 800 samples. Uh, and then this year, 2021, we only took 384 nosema samples. So I don't know what, what this says, if beekeepers are less concerned about it or, or they're just, um, uh, you know, where there's the year where it was hard to get fumagillin as well. So it, it, nosema is a tough one. Uh, yeah, because uh, it's obviously, you know, it's not good for our bees, but uh, how bad is it really? It seems to be, uh, you know, I think, uh, Natalie, when we look at the survey data, I don't think any beekeepers blame Nosema for for their colony loss. When we look right, at that, that's true. That's from the the National uh, Loss and Management Survey data, um, which um, in which we you know this is a questionnaire that we send every April and we ask beekeeper their opinion about the cause of death. And that's true that Nosema uh, tends to be one of the uh, very down the line uh, at the at the bottom of the of the cause for concerns for, for beekeepers as, as they report to us. One more thing that I would I would mention uh, compared to what Matt just said, it is true that um, um, you know one of the reasons that we keep uh, Nozima um, and, and we were thinking of, of reducing the amount of Nozima that, that we're actually uh, asking you to take, but what is very interesting is to see this drop from May to June because we know that uh, uh, most of our Sentinel participants do not use a treatment for Nozima. So um, you can see how you know, we see this natural drop. And so maybe the question is, if there, if there are some of your colonies that don't drop, those might, you know, might worse um, more careful attention. Um, but usually after the springs, you know, this, it doesn't seem to be really worse to continue checking for, for Nozema. Um, so yeah, it's, I guess this is a proof to show that uh, if there is Nozema, it's usually early in the year and after a few months, it's just disappeared on its own. Could I add something to it on my research? Yes, of course. Um, Nozema uh, is like a winter disease of, of December, January, and February, and March. And because the health, uh, the bees don't, in many areas, don't get enough cleansing fights. So it builds up in through the hives. And then, and then in May, when we get a not, uh, healthier uh, lifestyle for the bees, they seem to brush it off and move on. Right, yeah, that's con that confirms a little what I was saying. I, yeah, I think you, you know, that is a, the, um, this idea that, uh, yeah, this is when, when colonies, before they start building up, um, before they start bringing in pollen and, and, and clear out the nosy mound there. Um, thank you. Eric, did we have another question? Yes, so that was a really good question just came in. Um, so someone asked, it was I see Michael Coppola, why are there no sentinel apiaries in the highest honey producing states? And, and Michael, that is a fantastic question. Mm. Does anybody want to take this one? Well, I will. Um, it's because they haven't signed up for the program. And <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> It's not a fun, you know, wild uh, scientific answer. It's just they have not signed up for it. Um, so just one thing I want to add about that and, and, you know, just to kind of touch on how are people. Um, so as, as you all know, we're, we're, we're a relatively actually small nonprofit. We do, we're, we try to be as many places as we can. Um, but a lot of what we do is word of mouth. And, um, you know, one of the things that we're trying to focus a little bit more on is, is getting the program established in, you know, by working with state organizations or by working with 
um, kind of larger organizations who can help um, kind of facilitate the distribution of the program. So that's something that we're working on actively now to kind of expand the one representation, like for example, um, you know, my, my home club, Montgomery County Beekeepers Association, um, you know, our, our apiary manager, um, Maureen Jace McQuite, I think is on the call. She's been using this as a tool in our teaching apiary to help people actually, you know, learn how to do good record keeping because that's, that's an essential skill that, you know, any good beekeeper has is they have to be able to take good records and then be able to look back and see, okay, well, my colonies didn't make it. What went wrong and how can I do better? Um, but the other thing is, uh, you know, they can use it for um, a, a number of, as, as Rachel mentioned, I mean, not just a team here, but, you know, we've, we've actually started to distribute it, you know, work with um, our members by basically offering a, a small sponsorship. So it's a partial sponsorship. Of course, you have to pay to participate in the program because those resources that we use, everything, you know, it has to be paid for. We don't have funding from other sources. Um, however, so that, that's, that's one thing that we're trying to do is find ways to work with these um, different clubs and different organizations producing states like, you know, if, like the uh, Wisconsin Honey Producers Association. They actually have done a similar setup where they offer a partial sponsorship. So there's a, there are a couple of things to, to help with that. Um, but again, uh, if, if you know anybody who's in a club and you guys are like a state club or a local club that's able to um, facilitate that, please have them you know, contact Rachel or myself. We're happy to talk to them about setting something up and, and some of the cool tools that we're working on developing to allow these organizations access to their data so they can kind of tell their members what that means as well. And let's see here. Um, see any other questions here? Okay, so Varroa number increases with uh, so yeah, that was Michael. So thank you for asking that, Michael. Uh, I will that. also open for general questions about if we had a Sentinel participant on the call, we had which had questions about their participation this year, because um, we do have a, a panel of uh, of. of uh, of a you know big part big parties that can answer multiple questions so and and there is actually there's one more really that I think would be appropriate for you um, um Erpenbeck asks so does the varroa spike also depend on the climate um the chart shows autumn being straight I'm just curious if the varroa spike depends on weather or if it's not associated and it spikes regardless of north versus south um and yeah, regions so that is a great question. And um, I didn't have a chance to show everything on my slide, but I'm gonna share an extra, an extra figure that's gonna appear in the report. So <clears throat> on my slide, I show you the East, North, Central, North East and South East, because this is the regions for which this year we had a participant in 2021. But earlier year um, in, in, the, in the Sentinel program, we, we had sometimes participants from other states all combined, you know, all previous year combined. And so you can see how this, this spike actually, you know, very depends on, on the region. Some, some, some states, um, some regions speaking earlier than others. Um, and so, so yes, we do see a regional effect on, on the trend of, 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 um, of the Zima. I mean, some states, some, some regions, we don't have enough uh, participants to be able to see anything, for example, South. Um, but you can still see that um, um, you know this 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 trend of Nzima is is general to most region, but really dip, is more intense in some uh, than others. If that answers your question. And then we have thank you, thank you, Nelly. Then um, so Michael Sullivan asked, is there a cost? I guess I will let Rachel answer that one. I, I think Eric uh, was trying and his, his um, sound cut out. Um, yes, uh, so as he mentioned earlier, um, we do, the program is at a cost. It is actually at cost. Um, so we do have to 
yeah, I mean, we're working on on finding other sources, sponsors, and, and all that to help out the beekeepers, but right now it is provided at cost, um, just for the actual like materials and, and processing of the samples. So hopefully one day we'll get enough sponsors that it can just be completely free. Um, so talk to your local bee clubs. Okay. And, um, and it looks like Carly has a, a question or statement. Um, Carly, do you want to, do you want to maybe unmute and I'm not sure if. Yeah, let me. Yeah. So, <laughs> hey, Carly, how are you? Hi, uh, I'm, I'm an epidemiologist. So like I get in on data and it looks to me like one of the things you might do to improve the, um, comprehension of your data is to anchor your data not on calendar time because bees don't live in our calendar they live in their calendar and so if you anchored your data on say last frost date or some other bee important date and and pulled the um, new england data in line with the southern data by weather you might give yourself less of this like regional variation. You might actually line up a little bit better. And I don't know how that'll affect the numbers of hives you have in each month, but it, it might help explain some of those. I mean, central US, uh, you know, Minnesota, Michigan, they are cold places. And uh, it, it's just, uh, and that you could see it in the feeding data. We don't feed in May in Maryland, we're, we're pulling honey. So, you know, it, it, it would help, I think. Um, it, it might be a nice analytical tool. That's, that's a great point, Gary. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good idea. We will do that. I'm not promising that for the report this week, but. <laughs> I will yes, out. go home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Thank leaving for remember. Belgium in two days. <laughs> Natalie can do amazing things in very short amounts of time, though. So well, and already <laughs> someone know. saying anchor to first pollen in spring. I mean, you'll you'll get into fights about what the right anchor should be, <laughs> at, but I think it might be interesting to see what happens to the data if you change that anchor point. Mm, that's a great idea. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you very much. So yeah, let me see here. What else have we got? Any other questions coming in? Um. Let's see, Anthony. Okay, yeah, I see if yeah, Randy mentioned that. That was just talked about there. And I am coming. Okay, so we have um, a Patricia. Patricia. Oh, I've got to change my screen size. Sunberg, I'm sorry. Hey, Patricia. So I'm a commercial beekeeper that has tried to be a part of having the BIP follow our apiary. I'm always told that you have the commercial beekeepers you want that do the same travel we do at Montana to California, Washington, Montana. And that yeah, you don't really want any others. I know that there are other, uh, I know others have gotten the same answer and that there isn't money to expand. So we do all have our own sam we do all of our own samples and send them in to other testing. We also participate in the state collecting samples for the national average for the APHIS program. Um, as I know others from Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, et cetera, do as well. Just thoughts. So that's that's very helpful. Thank you for sharing that, Patricia. Um, in that case, I mean, if you all are doing your own testing and you'd like to contribute to the, the like the kind of the growing database I mean certainly we'd love to have you participate in the Sentinel Apiary program um, unfortunately as I guess as they have mentioned it's really the resources to expand is the challenge um, you know as as we've got a lot of data points if you will um, not to not to minimize the amazing work you all do as data points but that's that's one thing that um, you know, like say there, there isn't the resources to necessarily expand on the same services. So if, if that would be helpful to you and it would, it would certainly be helpful to us um, as far as the Sentinel Apiary side and, and the data coming in from there, we'd love to have you on board with that. And it, it may be a good fit because it sounds like it may be something you're already kind of doing. Uh, one thing that I will also add to that, uh, Eric, I'm not sure how, you know, how soon we'll be ready, but uh, we do also have, uh, currently, all of our Sentinel participants get access to the Sentinel app. That's part of the the perks. Um, but there is a start of having of giving uh, other beekeepers access to the app as well for their own management of assets and and entering management information and 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 if you have a monitoring of varroa load that you've done on your own, that that could actually also be part of that documentation. Um, but um, no promises as to when that will be 
Ready? So yeah, I guess, um, do we want to move on? And we've got about, it looks like 22 minutes. Do we want to kind of, or I guess we kind of are answering these questions, but um, we can move on to the, the panel aspect if, uh, if we're ready to and, and wrap things up with that. This wasn't the panel? I mean, I don't know. I, I haven't, I haven't heard, I haven't heard, you know, your beautiful voice a whole lot. I mean, that's probably well, my fault though. We're actually a little bit over time. Oh, we're let's, over time. Let's do the panel. I thought we were going till yeah. seven thirty. <laughs> well, we no, still let's do, let's do let's do the panel. <laughs> so, and we I know we have a couple of uh, you know state apiarists, apiarists, and uh, you know, some other folks. So I mean, we could we could always kind of open the uh, open the open the, the uh, mic up. You know, if there's questions pertaining to anybody particularly. Yeah, and, and any um, any bit people or or attendees or whoever, if you if you can't stay any longer, that's totally fine. Any questions that we receive that, well, I mean, this is recorded, um, but we'll be holding on to questions, and I'll send out a Q and A, um, or I'll, I'll link it when I link the recording. So, if anybody has to go, that's totally totally fine. And thank you so much for joining us. And now that you've said that and we can cut the future part, it's totally unacceptable to leave now. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, we still got about 100, 113 people. Um, so yeah, I guess if anybody has any additional questions that we could answer, um, you know, please feel free to you know, unmute yourself, you know, put yourself on camera. We'd love to see your face and, and uh, you know, jump on in. Uh, Eric, let me just just make a comment that you said to me, which is that I only have three hives, but in my neighborhood, there are a lot of beekeepers. And the, the concept that we could combine together as a group and become a sentinel site, because we're all within like a oh, mile yeah. of each other. But Absolutely. what is that limit of geography that you would consider a single site? So that's a very good question. So with, with this, so when we first started the program, we basically required people to have four colonies in the same apiary. Bless you. <laughs> so that, that was one thing that was, um, that was kind of a previous uh, aspect. But as of last year, we opened that up to, basically, there are no necessary restrictions on the specific sites. Each individual person logging their data would actually be able to input their geographic location. So if you were to buy, let's say, um, you know, a, a 12 colony kit, for example, and you wanted four and one of your, or you, you wanted three, a neighbor wanted five, and then another neighbor wanted four. You could certainly do that and even save some money in the process, which I'm a fan of. <laughs> and the, the reason we did that is because we did, re we did realize that some beekeeper were splitting kits and we thought, well, we would rather have the real locations and just let them, let the beekeepers organize the way they want and actually get us, you know, give us information about the two location then just do it behind or back so we and hands off beekeeping <laughs> it's a well-known practice <laughs> yeah so so uh, on that note for splitting kits we do request that um that participants still mail them in like within a day or two of sampling um and so it, it's best if they can all be mailed to the lab together uh, but if that's just not possible then that's okay we'd rather have them as soon as possible after they're sampled um, I think last year we had a, we had a, a good number of participants who split kits and, and mailed them all together. We had one kit that they were in different counties that were like, like bordering counties. So they mailed them separately because they just couldn't have gone 30 miles to <laughs> drop off one sample bottle. But Anyone else have any other questions? Well, if you let me, I'll just like yeah, chat keep, all night. Keep asking. So here's the <laughs> other thing that all of my friends, we always want to know is what are the bees bringing in? And it seems technically not that difficult to do PCR on pollen and know what bees are bringing in. Has anyone ever considered adding that to 
an analysis of like a Sentinel program? I could take that one, Eric. Go for it. Uh, yeah, that's actually something that the BIP team is looking at offering our commercial beekeepers. I actually have done that myself. I, I keep bees in Colorado and uh, it was, wasn't this season last year though. Uh, I had my honey analyzed. I, I called a couple places. There's the old school method where they actually get out the microscope and identify the pollen and they look at a picture of what it is and it's very laborious and it's, you have to have a lot of skill to do it. And it was 200 plus dollars. The PCR analysis, the DNA sequencing for my honey was $85 a sample. And I got this nice report back. It showed me the Latin names of everything they found in there and it quantified it. Now, you need to know though, that this is the pollen in your honey. So that doesn't mean it's the, the honey content, the nectar. So there's, um, then there's what's known as the co, there's a coefficient that you're supposed to use because uh, some plants will be, you know, a high pollen producing plant, but low nectar and then vice versa. So you need to know, and I've been looking for this book. I can't find it. Uh, if anyone on the, on the, uh, on the meeting here knows, uh, um, I think I talked to you about it once, Natalie, I was, I should send you that book. You could look it up in your, in your scholarly stuff. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, so the question was, has anyone done that? The answer is yes. Did that, right? Yeah, no, that's super interesting. And I, yeah, I mean, you could catch pollen, you could have pollen in, in, uh, in honey. Um, yeah, it would be very interesting if you had a lot of pollen coming in from some late blooming thing in your honey, you know, like how are bees mixing pollen with honey. That's kind of another interesting thing. Is it contemporaneous or not? That would take a lot of sampling. <laughs> that would more be... data though. So, so we did have a, another question come in and this is, this is kind of cool because it's pertaining to the, um, like some of the questions we ask beekeepers. Um, and it's Joanne Vaughn. She asked, do you ask the beekeeper, uh, do you ask if the beekeeper used an overwintered hive or a purchase package, which came up from the South? So like, you know, or, you know, I guess, I guess a purchase package that came from either from the South or out of state, you know, I guess from California. And uh, yeah. Right. So this is about the origin of the colony at the start of the year, uh, right? And um, uh, I do remember that in previous year, that was part of the questions on, on paper. Now that when we made the, the application this year, uh, I think we simplified, and I don't remember if this if this question uh, was kept or not. So um, um, we wanted to really simplify the, the amount of information that we ask of you the first year to try to encourage and, and trick all of you to start using the app and then complicate it over over you know over multiple years before you realize that we ask you a lot of information. <laughs> so. Um, this is a question that we might we might uh, add add back to the app. Uh, yeah. Thank you, and and also um, just for those um, and and Matt, you should have led this with this is not an advertisement because you know, uh, but Jonah oh, Jonah Jones is the uh, the, yeah. the, pro, the um, testing that that Matt had mentioned he used personally. Um, so okay, next question is from Maureen J. Um It's kind of a comment. But uh, it's, I believe in our first year when they were participating a few years back, they were encouraged to send in pollen samples, but they were never tested and thought that uh, she heard that that was that it wasn't done. And um, this was actually not for the well, actually I guess it could have been for determining the the origin of the pollen because I think there was a program going on at some point that is no longer going on. But uh, also I believe that the uh, Maryland Department of Ag had wanted to do some pesticide processing. So Maureen, I'm not sure if that could be either one of those. Do you, you so I, I do remember earlier in the, in the early years of Sentinel, we did have a, um, a program where we asked to collect pollen and we actually, had, this was a, 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 a student's project in which some students were, were sorting pollen based on their color to try to estimate the diversity. Um, and it just ended up to be really more, you know, complex uh, and difficult that we, we saw that. So a lot of those pollens were um, used for pesticide analysis. Um, and it just, 
made us aware that if we wanted to go into identification Holland, we needed a, a professional partner, yeah. which is something that we're considering now. Yeah. Currently. Awesome, thank you. Now, uh, we've got another question here from Susan Curtis. And she asked, um, did you collect data about mite loads from apiaries that did not introduce new packages or new boxes versus apiaries? Um, so basically individual. Um, yes. And that uh, that brought in new bees in the spring. Wondering if, uh, yeah, Steve, the audience. Um, let's see here. So okay, you brought in new bees in the spring. Wondering about the effects of keeping a colony isolated over time. Right, so I think that that relates to the same question about uh, management, so documenting other types of management, so like, you know, bringing in new colonies from outside uh, versus, versus not. Uh, I do also believe that this relates to more of the, you know, the isolation of your yard, and that is something that is, that is hard for us to, even if we ask you, you know, how many colonies you have in one yard, it still doesn't tell us if you have near, 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 neighbors nearby and you might not even be aware that you have beekeepers uh, in your neighborhood or how close or how far they are. So those are very interesting and we are all, we are very interested in this density effect uh, and the number of apiaries sharing a location or, or being nearby one another. It is just very tricky to actually get that information. But um, if you have um, suggestions, we are uh, welcome to hear them because this is something that we are interested in, in investigating more. Stephen, hey Stephen, how are you? Good to see you again. <laughs> now you're muted, but I see I see you smiling. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Doing well. How's, you know, you're you're down in is it New Mexico, right? Yes, sir. Ooh. I just had to. The coyotes are going crazy outside. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> or so, um, do you have a minute for a suggestion about a sampling for next year? Something I ran into. Yeah, I think, yeah, we're going okay. to your suggestions. Okay. So, um, you know, I usually do the sampling by myself. And so when I, when I have the jar, this isn't the jar because I've sent them all in, but when I have the jar and I've heard some people complain about the filter, I mean, the funnel, the funnel does fit nicely, but I've tipped it over several times doing this thing because I'm myself. So what I did is I just made a simple little, out of a flat piece of cardboard, I made sort of a bottle a bottle holder. So this will sit on the ground and it won't tip over. And so it's not a box. I mean, it would be a real simple thing to create this little, I just made it out of a flat piece of cardboard and I would think it could be slipped into the kit, you know? Um, so it, it's, I don't know. That's just an idea that I use because I did tip over at least one bottle out of my samples this year. <laughs> and it was very embarrassing. Cause I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? But, um, so this doesn't cost really any money per se. It just had to, I just taped it so it would stand up. And I, I don't know, I just thought it might be helpful for maybe some clumsy people like myself. That's, that's a really good suggestion. And we, I mean, we do have undergrads who can, who can do that stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and like I said, it's just a, a flat piece of cardboard. It wouldn't add anything to the shipping cost. And you can just cut, notch the corners and create a little stand for the bottle. And it does add sustainability because I mean, how many boxes do we uh, recycle Absolutely. Lab. I mean, goodness. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's a good suggestion. Anyway, thank you. I just yeah. To... Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. You're gonna get one. You're gonna get one next year. And <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll compare it to see which one holds up better. Yours will. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that. We will definitely. Yeah, we're always looking for ways to make it easier to sample because we, you know, we we understand it's tough. It's. I mean, either that or I need to find some friends. <laughs> Well, you can get a glove. What I do is I, I have a piece of flashing, you know, similar to like what um, I know, like the, the guys when they're sampling out in the field, um, they have you know, a piece of flashing and they'll you know, take the frame out. Once they find the right frame, they'll put the flashing in its place, you know, shake those frames of bees into that flashing. And you can just basically dump them right in the, you know, right into the, uh, the container from that piece of flashing and just, you know, shake it, you know, kind of wiggle it back and forth as they're going in and they'll, they'll fill the thing right up. Well, it wasn't so much the the funneling. The uh, I think the funnel worked great, but for me, it was the stability of the bottle. Yeah. See, I, yeah, I hold the bottle while I'm doing it. That that helps. I, yeah, I gotta I gotta say something too, Eric. Here, 
Yeah. When I started with BIP, uh, you know, I, I used to sample bees a lot. I'd slam a bin and a slam a frame into a bin and scoop out of the bin or, or like do what Steven's talking about, the funnel stuff. Uh, but then when I worked with BIP, I, I realized, oh, you could just take the bottle and scoop it right off the frame. Uh, <laughs> and so that's what a lot of the BIP guys do. But we're, you know, we're taking 1,500 samples a year. So you, you kind of get impatient and you just scoop it right off the frame. Or there's a, a blog uh, we did, uh, Eric, it has that shoot you're talking about, the flashing. If you Google scooping bees, be informed, you'll see a blog written about how to sample bees. Um, and there's different methods on there. But uh, yeah, I could talk scooping bees all day. Yeah, you could. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Sweet. Thank you, Matt. That's not, that's good. Uh, right. I forgot about the, yeah, the blog post. That's the one you did the, uh, the um, prototype on, right? Uh, the what? You did a prototype for scooping bees. Oh, yeah, there is a prototype where I actually screwed a funnel on to the, the sample bottle and scooped right off the frame with the funnel, you know, attached. I first had it nice and glued, but it turns out duct tape uh, is the answer to everything. And uh, it works pretty well. I use it in the field. I, I have a new prototype, P2, oh. uh, and it's even better. I should, I, I have a video. I should put it on the blog. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's even better. We did like, I don't know, uh, 400 and some samples with it uh, recently. Nice. Pretty proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And, and it held together. Yeah, uh, it worked great. Um, no duct tape on this prototype either. It just stuffs mm -hmm. in the tube, fits perfectly. It's nice mm -hmm. and stiff, scoop right off the frame. And I, yeah, I'll post that if, uh, yeah. That's that's awesome. That's what that's what the field specialists think about. <laughs> it's like how can I do this without doing any more work? <laughs> like Stephen does, yeah. I mean, yeah, make life easier. We are all beekeepers here, which means we're all tinkerers. So, <laughs> it's like, yeah, bee, beekeepers and blacksmiths, I think, share a lot of lot in common. I could see that. <laughs> like, yeah. we can make something to to work this out. Yeah, okay. yeah. We, we have another question that just came in from Ray Walker. Um, do you collect data for colony queen age and or hive weight? So that's a good question. Um, and if we break that into two, I think you know we do have um, some integration, some uh, uh, the actual three letter I what's what's the integration with like different hive monitors? Um, yes, there's a I can answer that. There's a, there's a hive monitor portal where if, uh, if you uh, have a hive scale from a company that is integrated with the API, uh, then, uh, you know, your data does go into this uh, portal. And uh, if you go to the research.beinformed.org, it's a link there and you can get on a public map and look at uh, hive scale data. Thank you, Michaela. And, and Michaela is our IT gal. She's a uh, she's responsible for pulling all the all the stuff together on the technical side. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's my dog. You can maybe hear him back here. He is a chocolate lab. <laughs> Welcome, addition. Um, so we've had a couple of questions about when registration actually begins. So we usually coincide the registration with the beginning of the ABF conference, um, which this year begins on January fifth. So registration will for the Sentinel program will begin on or before January 5th. Okay. Thank you for asking. That's a great question. Very good question. So we have another uh, excellent question from Melanie Mitchell. She says, okay, I have to know this. Who are the folks counting the bees in the samples and doing the super science of the data collection? And how long does it take to process one sample bottle? Just curious. And we have we have spreadsheets to tell you the answer. <laughs> we do. And we also have, I don't know if she is still here, but we have our um, uh, current uh, Varroa processor. Um, she was here, Heather. Um, during the pandemic, she's been doing a superhuman job of processing all of the Varroa. Um, 
we do also have undergrads for that um, in non-pandemic years. Um, and then the nosema is, so she, so Heather's counting all the bees and then um, the nosema is processed by a few of us in the lab. And it takes, so it takes about an hour to do a round of 12 samples uh, just on the shaker, which is the varroa processing uh, contraption. And then it takes maybe an hour to process 10 nosema samples. So about two hours for, for 12 of them. Um, and that's like at peak processing. So it takes a long time. <laughs> and that doesn't include all of the data work and stuff. So. So um, one thing that we didn't mention um, earlier, and then, oh, so, hey, Sarah, how are you? Sarah said, asks, Sarah Redlard asks, speaking of ABF, we're looking for a few volunteers for kids and bees on Friday morning. Super fun and great opportunity to network with other beekeepers and get points for master beekeeping certifications. Uh, you can email Marie at beegirl.org if you'd like to join in on the fun if you'll be at ABF, folks. So, you know, to the, uh, to the 78 of you left here, keep that in mind. Um, so yeah. And so, hey, um, before we go, because I know it's 730 and I think we're already half hour over allegedly. I, I thought it ended at 730, but um, we wanted to do a, a giveaway. We, that's one thing we usually do at our Sentinel um, collective meetings. And we'll ask a question and you know, we ask people to uh, you know, comment with their best guess or you know, whatever in the chat. And um, and we give away a particular item. Now, since we didn't talk about this before, what's something we'd like to give away there, Rachel? <laughs> a disease manual is always a good option. Yeah, the disease manual, that's good. Cause that, that's, uh, that's ongoing education for, for all. I, honestly, I have a couple editions and, and, uh, and copies here. Um, just because I like one in my car, I like to have one nearby, but there have been countless times when something's going on and I, you know, you peek in there, and I know the the, the uh, tech team guys also keep these handy. Although, you know, most cases, you know, by now they probably know what they're looking at. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, Natalie. So yeah, we'll ask a question, and then just everybody select uh, Eric in your in your chat to answer to, so that only him can see your answer. And we will do we will do the selection of the the vic the Victor. That's not how you say it. The winner. <laughs> Is going to be um, uh, price is right rules. So the closest that doesn't go over. Yeah. So so make sure that you include some sort of contact information in your message to Eric. Yeah. Uh, after afterwards, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll 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 say who the winner is, and then we'll ask the winner to send. Well, us, I, I yeah, say that because we your house to, to for a visit. Okay. So the question. <laughs> so the question is question is hold on wait for it okay how many samples were sent in to the lab this year so how many that's so you don't don't answer it out loud just well, send it to me in a message just sentinel or everything just sentinel oh, okay sentinel. how many sample oh, sentinel program uh, and yeah make sure you send it directly to eric yeah. malcolm so all of those individual sample bottles right how many samples were sent to the lab and it's closest without going over. And Eric will tell you the answers. We'll give it a couple of seconds. Oh, that's, it's funny. It, it actually, it started low and started working its way up. I will give you. Like, yeah, Greg already threw in his email. He's like, I'm going to win this. <laughs> Matt, you don't get one, but good try. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we're going to give, uh, we're going to give it just another, another, uh, let's say 10 seconds. So 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. All right. Can uh, somebody post stop? <laughs> All right, there you go, Jerry, that works. If a bottle arrives in the lab and no one is there to process it, does it still count? 
<laughs> count it. Oh, there dear. is always somebody to process the samples, even yeah. if it's take time, even if it's sent directly to Rachel's on the <laughs> that was that was Jerry Parent. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry is Jerry is uh, is one. She's our grant writer for BIP, but also works with us at the University of Maryland B Lab as well. Um, but yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Jerry. That's a good question. All right, so we have a tie, I believe. There's there's a uh, yeah yeah we have a tie. Um, really? Yeah, well, it was just funny. They're both the exact same number, and they both. Oh, that's, some, that's somebody that paid really attention to the slides because you twelve twelve below. They're twelve off. Ants was 2,312. And we've got, uh, yep, the answer is three. And we've got Mary Malcourt. And we also have uh, where you, uh, Michael Galinsky. Both came in with 2,300. <laughs> well done. <laughs> so if both of you could send me your, um, your email, I'll, oh, there you go. Send to net. That'd be even better. And um, let's see here. And you can act, yes, yeah, just send it right to her via chat. She'll actually be the one shipping those out. <laughs> and with that, we wanted to thank all of you for coming and uh, participating in our end of year webinar. And we're looking forward to starting the Sentinel season next year again. Rachel, do you want to take it to the final words? Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really enjoyed having you all here today. Um, we really appreciate you taking time out of your days to do this. And we hope you learned something or had fun or a little bit of both um, and hope to see you next season. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to post my email in the chat and make sure I typed it correctly. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Net, did you get uh, messages from both of them? The I got one. I got Michael. Michael to me, so I'm going to forward that to you right now. Saratoga, nice. I need the second winner's address. Okay, did you get it? I just, uh, just I got um, I got Michael. I don't know who the second winner was. Oh, okay. So Marie. Oh, she sent to me as well. I need okay. a physical address to send the manual. Oh, all right. Well, I know we've got Marie as a participant. Thanks, Fred. Good to see you. Um, got some uh, emails. I can actually, I'll follow up with them. If they're not here any longer, I'll follow up with them and get their physical addresses. Marie, are you there? And Michael, are you still there? Or have you guys left? They're both here. Right. If you can send net. Uh, Meredith, in the chat, if you can send her your your actual mailing address, she can get those out to you right away. Okay, I've got both of them now. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. Thank, Thank you. Ned. See y'all later. Bye, everyone. And